everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you for this IINA webinar, which is co-organized with the European Parliament Information Office in Ireland. And we're delighted to be joined today by Marid McGuinness, MEP, first Vice President of the European Parliament, who has been generous enough to take time out of her schedule to speak to us. Uh, Vice President McGuinness uh, will speak to us for 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, and then we will go to question and answers with our audience. Um, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And then we will come to them once uh, Vice President McGuinness has finished her presentation. Uh, could I remind you that today's presentation and the question and answer are both on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle uh, at IIEA. So let me now uh, introduce Vice President McGuinness, who is back in Brussels uh, for the first time this week, having been away uh, from uh, in Brussels uh, as everybody was uh, um, in quarantine uh, in their home areas. Uh, Marid McGuinness MEP is the first Vice President of the European Parliament and representative of the Midlands Northwest constituency. And she was first elected as an MEP in 2004 and was re-elected for a fourth term in 2019. And in her role as first Vice President, she's responsible for overseeing relations with national parliaments and the administrative consequences of Brexit, among others. And Ms. McGuinness is also the first replacement for chairing debates and votes uh, in the parliament when the president is absent. Um, the vice president is a member of a number of parliamentary committees, including the Agriculture and Rural Development Committee, the Parliament's Bureau, and the European Economic Area Joint Parliamentary Committee. She's also a substitute member of the Constitutional Affairs Committee, the Environment, Public Health, and Food Safety Committee, and the Delegation for Relations with Mercosur. And uh, Vice President McGuinness's uh, prominence in the Parliament and her position on the Constitutional Affairs Committee, the committee responsible for overseeing the Brexit process, has resulted in her becoming a regular commentator on Brexit developments in both the national and the international media. Uh, uh, she is an agricultural economist by profession and as a result, she was selected as the European People's Party lead negotiator for the reform of the common agricultural policy. So it is uh, in this timely event, uh, the Vice President will discuss the role of the European Parliament in the EU's response to the crisis and the part it plays in laying the foundation for the EU's long-term recovery. I know it's a wide-ranging address, so we look forward to hearing you uh, Vice President, and the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. I think these events have been super. I've been logging in and listening to many of your events, and I think that for lots of people, it's been a great way to work and learn at the same time. So I hope I can add to that conversation and add value. I think I'll start with the reality of how we're working, because as you rightly said in the introduction, this is my first week back in Brussels. In early March, we this pandemic had begun to take a foothold, and there were some very uh, big decisions taken here in the Parliament by the President and very brave decisions when he decided to cancel our travels to Strasbourg and indeed to curtail our meetings in Brussels and to urge people to return to their own member states. And I remember at the time thinking, this won't last very long or not being sure of the outcome. But I now reflect very well that those were important decisions. We were coming from so many different places that it was important that we as parliamentarians returned to our member state and were able to, um, I suppose, be safe with our own families, but also give some lead to others in this time of crisis. What's been really interesting since March is how this parliament has responded both technically and politically to the realities of not being physically present. 
Um, I took a flight on Monday morning, a very empty flight to Brussels, uh, wore, wore, wore my mask, and indeed I have a mask here with me because here in the Parliament we are required to wear masks when we're not speaking. So when we're walking around this building, we wear a mask and we have lots of signs to warn us about COVID-19. But to come back to the Parliament and how we functioned since uh, this pandemic, in the early days it was a little bit uh, stressful because our technology wasn't ready. But I would say within seven to 10 days, the administration and our IT people had put in place the technology where I could work from my home in County Meath or where my colleagues in Germany could do the same or in Italy or wherever they were based, we could contribute. There were some colleagues who were physically present and they were coming into the parliament, but in very limited numbers. And, you know, by the time um, I left my home to come out here and I'm going to be staying over the weekend and into next week for the plenary session, we were able to contribute to all committee meetings and to vote in committee. We were able to vote in plenary, but we could not contribute to the debate. But I think it was um, a real tribute to the parliament here that we could do that. And we had the added complication, but also an added importance of having translation and interpretation uh, so that we could have good conversations with all our colleagues uh, in the language that they could freely use. Uh, so that really worked. And I think we will probably learn a lot of lessons from that experience, which I hope will guide us when things return to whatever sort of normal they will return to. And just on that point, I think that even over the summer months and into the autumn, we are all going to be mindful that coronavirus or COVID-19 is present. And yes, member states are coping well. And indeed, the story from Ireland is quite good, but that we can't be complacent. And I've been saying it here to some of my colleagues who perhaps are not wearing the mask in the appropriate way that really it needs to be over your nose, not under. So these are the learning points. But I think from a, a parliament point of view and from the bureau that I sit on, I'm very pleased that we could continue to function as a, a political group because we are responsible for overseeing what the Commission does and linking with the Council. So the Parliament did not go into hibernation. In fact, it went into overdrive to make sure that we worked. So we had to come and vote remotely on releasing of emergency funds, uh, on important resolutions, and we have done that. And I think we will continue to do that next week. And next week, it will be a very strong um, parliamentary agenda. I think there will be more colleagues who will come from their member states, but there will still be many who will be able to vote from afar. There has been a debate then about should we go back to the way we were in terms of our functioning and I think when it comes to plenary the physical presence of members is important. I also think that when it comes to other parliaments in my work with national parliaments I'm going to be looking at how parliaments responded, the uh, interaction between parliament and government and indeed how people who want to make a point or a protest how that can happen in a pandemic and you, you reflected there that 2019 I was re-elected and all our colleagues were elected here to the European Parliament and I wonder out loud what would have happened if the pandemic occurred just in the moment of an election and I think these are things we probably will start preparing for now that we have this warning behind us so that's just how we structured ourselves and how we're allowed if you like or can be back here in Brussels and how we are functioning uh, and I think to the credit of all those involved I'm, I'm pleased that it has worked. I want to move then to probably the issue which is um, at the core of how Europe will be after this pandemic and that relates to the recovery um, this uh, if you like uh, next generation EU. And I think when the President of the Commission announced this uh, major package with significant funding, it did, if you like, quell some of the anxiety about how the European Union had responded to the crisis in the beginning, where there was a lot of, if you like, member states doing their own thing, border closures, etc. So I think that the announcement was strong. It was a big, ambitious plan. It involves, if you like, some clever uh, rearranging of of the multi-annual financial framework, the European budget, which has to kick in from 2021, um, but also looking at how the European Union can leverage its capacity to borrow money at really low interest rates and then support those member states that are in need of support, those worst hit, hit if you like, by the crisis. And the, fi 
figures you know, I mean, they go into the billions. Um, but what's been interesting now is that the discussion at member state level, both within member states, between member states, and in this house here, the European Parliament, there's some discussion about the balance between loans and grants, because it favours grants rather than loans, and that's of more benefit to those countries that have suffered most. There's the question of the repayment, should it happen sooner or should it be extended? Um, and there is also this big question which hung over the MFF anyway, about will those reluctant member states be willing to contribute more because we are dealing with this crisis? So I think the announcement was important. I think now we're into, if you like, the real hard graft of trying to get this over the line. And that will involve a lot of conversations at leaders level. It will involve a lot of conversations here within political groups. Uh, and then there will be the wider parliamentary, if you like, uh, support for this. So the detail, I think, has got to be fleshed out. But ultimately, it would see the European um, budget, the budget that people call on, whether it's for agriculture or research or for cohesion, being strengthened in the initial years to give that support that's necessary in those early years, because the problem is now. And then leveraging that to um, roll out repair payment. Um, and even amongst my own colleagues, when we have started to discuss the detail, there are differences of view as to how that should be handled. And I'm sure there will be some questions around that. Um, but what's been really important, I think, is that the direction in which the money will flow and how it is spent. Uh, there is no shying away, if you like, from the overarching growth strategy, which existed before COVID-19, which is the European Green Deal essentially making sure that Europe uh, deals with the climate issue, um, honours our commitments under the Paris Agreement and reorientates all of our sectors uh, in that direction. Um, and that includes also the digitalization of the European economy. So perhaps there was an expectation that with this crisis, we would forget all about that and just try and get ourselves back to some sort of normality, but that's not the case. And I think there is good support for that, that we keep on the track, but obviously we will need more funds to keep ourselves on that track and to make sure that we actually achieve uh, those targets. It will be more difficult now because member states are in a more difficult situation economically and unemployment is affecting yet the youth, which I think is a particular issue that we really do have to address. Um, I want to move briefly onto the topic of Brexit. It is very current, um, although there were weeks and months there where nobody really spoke about it because if you like its star rating as the only news item was taken by the tragedy of of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and that just wasn't uh, impacting just in Europe, it's impacting um, very seriously in the United Kingdom. And you know, for somebody who, you know, ate, slept and, and, and breathed Brexit for the last couple of years, it's been interesting how your mind can be thrown completely away from that because ultimately health was everything and we were faced with this public health crisis. But of course, Brexit is still there and it is at a very delicate situation. And just to reflect on the realities, it took three years, three prime ministers and a lot of you know, late discussion to get the withdrawal agreement over the line. And there were only three issues. Now, they weren't small issues. They were huge and important, but it did take that length of time and a lot of difficult politics to get it over the line. And I think our focus is on ensuring that that is fully implemented. And I think today there have been some useful talks led by um, Commissioner Sefcovic on that issue of implementation of the withdrawal agreement. And now we're looking at the future. Um, I rather we were still in January looking at the future, but we're now into June and there's not many months left in order for us to reach a trade agreement with the United Kingdom. Um, and I think Michel Barnier, who's a man who speaks very clearly and without any drama, has been very clear that he is not optimistic and that on many points, um, which were agreed in the political declaration with the United Kingdom and signed up to by the British Prime Minister, we have not seen the progress to date that we would need to see. Um, and he has gone through list upon list of what is not happening. Yesterday evening was interesting. Um, I got some calls from British media saying, oh, there's a big conference on Monday taking place between the leaders, the EU leaders, including our president here, President Sassoli, the president of commission and the president of the council with the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And I think that is important. It is this 
high level conference that was muted for June. And I suppose we all would have hope or expectation that on Monday, there would be, if you like, a political push behind the negotiations, which have been sluggish to date. Now, I think to be fair to all negotiators, the atmosphere or the pandemic has not helped insofar as it's been difficult to meet face to face. Uh, and we know that at the IIEA, it's been nice to meet face to face, but this also is good that we can uh, you know, have our conversations remotely. I think when you're dealing with delicate negotiations, body language is hugely important. The cup of coffee around quietly or the, the whisper, and it's impossible to do that uh, on a video. It just doesn't work. Um, so maybe if things are better in terms of controlling um, the coronavirus pandemic, we will be able to see a return to more face-to-face -face meetings. But we also would need um, a more, if you like, a reality check for the United Kingdom to understand the time limitations, to also live up to what was agreed in the political declaration. And while it doesn't have the same stance as the legal text of the withdrawal agreement, it was signed up to by all of us. And I think in terms of trust in the negotiations, we would hope that what was signed up to would at least be followed through in the detail. Because there are many, many difficult areas. And you know, we're into the month of June and we don't see any progress in those particularly difficult areas. And I suppose to sum it up for me, um, these negotiations are incredibly difficult because they're unpicking what I would regard as what's best in class, membership of the single market and customs union altogether, and trying to um, uh, facilitate uh, a, a, an ex-member of the European Union that is seeking to retain the best of the, all of the above, but none of the, uh, if you like, obligations of uh, being in a customs union and a single market. And therefore, when the word cherry picking was reused yesterday, it is an appropriate one. And I think we are mindful here in the Parliament as we move next week to debate this issue and indeed to vote on a resolution that we want an agreement with the United Kingdom. There is no one in the EU that does not want an agreement, but we do want it to adhere to our commitments to each other made in the political declaration. And I suppose to the reality that the European Union of 27 remains strong in its core values and the, and the issues we stand, if you like, close to and not willing to compromise those because there is a desire for the United Kingdom to have bits and pieces of what it would like to choose. So I would wish we had more progress to report, but I, I remain... Um, as, as uh, Michel Barnier used those words, not optimistic, but not pessimistic. And I think there is a, a shade of gray difference in between those two things. But when it comes to fisheries, agriculture, level playing field, um, state aid, all of these things matter. And you know, there would be nothing worse than a bad deal now because it would lead to very bad relationships thereafter. So I think we need to persist with what is currently um, uh, the, 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 the stance we are taking, but also the mandate that Michel Barnier has. I also think we're very lucky to have him. I think he has been a consistent, solid negotiator and extremely transparent and has spent time upon time giving the details of his conversations with all of us. I want to come back to linking the recovery and the way of the future um, and to talk about climate law, the Green Deal, including in that farm to fork strategy on biodiversity. Because if you look at, even if you listen to the public debate or even watching social media, because people have been locked down, it's been quite interesting that there's been, if you like, a greater um, interest in what's happening in nature or the world about us. It's been quite an interesting uh, phenomenon. And I think we've all been part of that, maybe because there was less noise or intrusion and we had to um, settle ourselves to just being where we are and taking notice of what's around us. In that context, um, the European Union climate law, and I'm the shadow rapporteur for the EPP on this, and we'll be negotiating it right up and through the summer. You know, it, it requires and has committed to the European Union to climate neutrality by 2050. It is not that long uh, down the road. I will probably not see it, but many of you will. Um, but it is a big commitment. And what the climate law is hoping to do is to set benchmarks along that path, if you like. So currently, the target is to reduce by 40% our emissions by 2030. That is likely to increase. And there are different views as to how significant the increase should be. Some would see 65%. Others would like to await the impact assessment, which will be available in September, which 
may point around 50 to 55 percent. Um, but the direction of travel is clearly there. And therefore, it requires all sectors to reorientate how they produce, um, looking at circular economy, um, looking at all of these things that have been happening anyway, but perhaps we're going to have to accelerate them. And also then pulling on the tools that will be available in the recovery package and the finance in order to make sure that we can deliver on those targets. I think it's interesting also that member states are at very different starting points. I mean, if you take the case that um, agriculture emissions, which are a big discussion point in Ireland, um, you know, in, in Europe, they're 10 percent um, across the board. In Ireland, 30 percent. And indeed, the Commission often point out that within that 10 percent, livestock emissions account for 70 percent of that. And therefore, this additional focus on livestock is part of this conversation. It can be a very difficult conversation. And our, there are some member states, for example, Denmark, who will seek to reduce by 70% by 2030. There are other member states like Poland that have a very high um, fossil fuel demand and whose uh, population use fuel for heat, etc. And they will find it more difficult to reach those targets. So while some members in this House would like to see all member states climate neutral um, by 2050, um, I think it would be more realistic to say that Europe is climate neutral by 2050, but that all should at least move in that direction. Um, and just let me move then to some of the specifics around, um, if you like, land use, farm to fork strategy and biodiversity, and linking it with my comment about us all becoming you know, more tuned in to what's going on around us. Um, there has been over years Years. It's not just now a concern about the loss of biodiversity. I think a lot of conversation around the loss of bees, for example, uh, although I noticed lots of them in the gardens and in the fields, which is good to report, but it is a concern about nature and the need to bring nature back and to revive it. Um, and also to, to make sure that sustainability is, the heart, is at the heart of everything we do. And that links into this very detailed farm to fork strategy, which requires, I think, several readings to take it from farm to fork. Um, I think it's really important for Ireland because um, while we have local market, we do rely on a wider market, the European Union market and beyond, because we produce so much food. Um, and therefore, I think we need to look very carefully at how our agriculture sector from farm to fork becomes more sustainable and indeed how the concept of local food is not just limited to the parish but also that local food is European um, and that Ireland can respond to those if you like need from some consumers now but perhaps more in the future to know where their food comes from how it is produced um, but the Commission is going very far in this strategy um, there are strict targets being set down at the farm level around um, use of agrochemicals fertilizers uh, around antimicrobials um, and right through then to look at sustainability issues um, in the food supply chain, but not as many targets there. So we will have to rebalance that. Then there is this always contentious issue about nutrition and claims on packages for consumers to make those informed choices. And I expect a big debate around that because I have to say I'm back to butter for a long number of years now. I really do like butter on my spuds, but I don't eat 20 spuds or a pound of butter at a time. So I, I, it's about, you know, know how we moderate diet but there are issues around health in our in Europe and indeed Ireland around malnutrition and around obesity so this is a very far-reaching paper and I think some of it is implementable but we will here in the Parliament be having our view um, and that will begin immediately which brings me to an issue which has perhaps dogged us here in the Parliament and is running for too long in my view that is reforming the common agriculture policy I was deeply involved in the previous reforms and indeed Simon Coveney was the Minister responsible at the time are now Thornishta. Um, and uh, I'm concerned this week, for example, that the negotiations between the um, groups was proceeding but has now stalled. So I'm a little concerned that that might mean a huge delay. There may also be part of a strategic move by some groups to say, well, look, the farm to fork and biodiversity strategy need to be stitched into cap reform. And goodness me, how will that be done? So I think there are some uncertainties there. Um, and I think from the farming point of view, we have voted through a transitional measure so we weren't clear on the budget or on the detail so there is at least a provision for the next year or two a transition from the existing cap towards 
the new reform. But I, I would wish there were more certainty around that. But I'm afraid even at the end of this week, I fear there is more uncertainty. The last point, and I will be brief on, on this, is this idea of a conference on the future of Europe. We will be debating it here in the Parliament. And, you know, I think since COVID-19, a lot of people didn't realise that the European Union has some responsibility around health, but has limited responsibility around public health, which is the member state competence. But we knew that when the crisis hit Europe, that we needed a more coordinated European response and therefore Europe needs to be a little bit more uh, or given more if you like um, responsibility in this area because when you're explaining to citizens around competence I think you're losing the argument and I think we would rather have at a European level the remit to make sure that in future we have the capacity around personal uh, protective equipment around supply of pharmaceuticals because these were issues um, that dogged us in the beginning of this crisis so the idea of a conference was was laid out by the President of the Commission von der Leyen at the start of her, if you like, mandate and when she was going through the uh, process of being ratified. Um, I think it was prompted by Brexit. I think it's been enhanced by, if you like, by COVID-19. But there is a reluctant partner at the moment, and that is the Member States and the Council. And we will be imploring the Member States, um, hopefully Ireland as well, to get on board and not to fear what might emerge from this conversation with citizens where we hope to listen more than we speak. Uh, because I think people have a lot to say. And what's been really interesting is that the idea um, which came from Ireland of citizens' assemblies is, is quoted frequently here in committee about how you could engage with citizens. So it's been good to hear that. Um, you know, I think the reluctance at member state level may be part of a political weariness that everyone's terrified that somebody might suggest treaty change. But to some extent, I think you can rule nothing out um, because, you know, yesterday will be different than tomorrow. And there may well be things that we will need to look at in terms of treaty change. Uh, and having lived through some referenda where I wasn't in politics and then was I, where I was, you know, it's good occasionally to let people have their say. And indeed, sometimes when they have their say, we are told off and we have to go back to the drawing board. So I would hope that next week will provide a stimulus um, to the council in particular to get on board with this and to come, to come uh, with ideas that we might start this conversation uh, at the latest at the end of this year. And you know, we, we're doing this remotely. We can also use technology where the pandemic doesn't allow us to physically connect to do that uh, in, in a remote way. Just uh, my last comment, if you like, is around... Um, healthy uh, tension, if you like. I, I work with national parliaments and increasingly, I suppose, there is that tension between European Parliament and national parliaments. And I think we need to try and understand each other better and work better together. Very often there's severe criticism of the European Union um, on issues that the very person whose political party they come from has been part of a decision. So those sorts of things are not helpful. And lastly, to say that some of the conversation and language at the moment around um, how Europe needs to, if you like, reshore some of its, um, for example, pharmaceuticals, uh, the issue around uh, med medical devices, etc. We need to be, I think, careful around that. I think we do certainly need to look at where we had weaknesses, uh, and that was the supply of raw materials. And we do need to look at diversifying our supply chain. But given that in other places there is a language, of, if you like, of looking back and being inward, I think for the European Union, we should uh, not, not, if you like, adopt the same language. Um, we should look at this in a different way and provide some global leadership around supply chains. So it's quite uh, positive that when it comes to the vaccine that we hope will come for COVID-19, that the Commission wants to work at, at, at EU level for member states in accessing the vaccine, but also making sure that the rest of the world has access to it as well. So those are my opening remarks and I look forward to both comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Vice President. That's very wide ranging, but I think touched on the really crucial points that are in the discussion at the moment. And uh, as you said yourself, COVID-19 has uh, derailed a lot of the, uh, some of the big uh, discussion points, uh, Brexit, for example, but these will all start gradually of course, coming back. We have uh, a number of questions and uh, I will put them to you. Uh, perhaps we'll take two or three together to give you uh, a better chance. I have a question here from Alan Dukes, uh, who says that um, the EU has no treaty competence in the area of health policy. What is the legal basis for the Commission's current activities in relation to COVID-19? And how far does this allow the Commission to go? Uh, 
Francis Jacobs, who is no stranger to the European Parliament, having been a representative here, um, said that uh, the Parliament has been leading on the idea of um, a conference on the future of Europe. But, uh, and I think you've spoken about that. And um, what does the European Parliament want to happen now on the timing and content of this conference? And how do you feel that Irish and other citizens' views uh, on the future of Europe can be meaningfully incorporated into this debate? Um, and Jackie Fisher says um, she would like to ask you how, how do you feel the Irish government has performed in that interaction between government and parliament, especially in the never-ending context of a possible second election this year. That brings us back a bit to domestic politics. But uh, perhaps I'll give you those three, uh, Vice President, and um, the floor is yours uh, for your comment. Okay, thank you. Um, and Alan, thank you very much. Alan knows more than I ever hoped to. So you probably know the answer already, Alan, to that question. I think very simply that there was a desire um, at uh, member state level that Europe did something, particularly when borders were being closed. But there's also the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, which has a amassed a huge amount of information, which was hugely helpful to member states in terms of dealing with the pandemic. So I think there was a capacity within existing um, legal frameworks for Europe to do all of that. Perhaps what there wasn't was a plan that should a pandemic happen, this would be the rollout. Um, so I, I dare say that if there ever is a second wave or indeed another um, crisis like this around public health, that the European Union will be better prepared because we will take earlier note of warnings from our own Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, which as I understand it, were warning very early in the year about this. And perhaps again, member states weren't as connected to what was happening or heeding those warnings. So I think there is a lesson to be learned from that. Um, when it comes to then the treaty idea of that we don't have much competence and if you want more about treaty change, which is why I referenced that in the Conference on the Future of Europe, there is a concern amongst the member states, uh, I would say a lot of them, that there might be a, a suggestion of treaty change. But in this area that we're just talking about, it seems to me that this would be a positive, that where Europe can act in a positive way around public health, then it should. And I also think that, you know, given what we went through in terms of austerity, and we could have lots of debates around that, there was also a recognition that investing um, in hospitals and in infrastructure is really necessary because when you don't have sufficient capacity at times of pandemic, you have to take extraordinary measures to put those in place. I'll move to the um, uh, Francis Jacobs question around uh, the EP leading on this. And yes, we have. We've already set out what we would like to see um, around this uh, conference on the future of Europe. And in a way, you have to keep talking about the future because there are you know, voters now and generations coming up who, who haven't been around, so they need to give their input. Input. I mean, there's uh, my family, for example, I was born and was, if you like, aware of when we joined the European Union, but my children have known nothing else, but they would have ideas about the future. So I think it's really important that there is an engagement at that level. Um, it's also, I suppose, to try and address which, what is sometimes called the disconnect. And I, I, I get cross about that sometimes because I think when it comes to um, a connect, I think that MEPs from Ireland, we, because of how we're elected, are connected, I hope, better than perhaps in other places where there isn't that process of having to go and meet your electorate, and not just when it comes to election time, but right throughout uh, the five years of your mandate, I think we are connected. I mean, for me, the, the issues around the future um, are dealing with how we um, re, if you like, focus society how we live, work and play to be more sustainable, um, how we deal with de demography, for example, how we, for example, and we're talking about this in Ireland, how we care for people, whether they're young or whether they're old. These are things that have actually raised their head, if you like, during the pandemic. So that will be part of the conversation. And, and the other thing I think the conference will do is allow people to understand what Europe does and what it doesn't do, because sometimes that's not very clear. But for me, it's more about listening than talking. Um, and I, I think that the, the, the conversations with citizens will be hugely important to drive the agenda rather than it being driven uh, by, by, if you like, the parliament or indeed commission or council. But I do think the issue is will and when will the council come on board? And I think that's hugely important. I only got part of the third question, which said something about a, a, another election, which of course is why I didn't hear the rest because I got a fright. I presume that government formation talks are still ongoing. That was the news from last night's meeting of our parliamentary party. Do 
you want to just refresh my mind on the actual question around that, please? Yes, I think, I think it was a, a question from Jackie Fisher, which uh, she was asking you to comment. You feel the Irish government has performed in that and how you feel it has performed in the interaction between government and parliament, especially in the never ending context of a possible second election this year. What yeah, I mean, that's why yeah, I opened my conversation. Yeah, thank you for that, for that, and apologies I didn't pick it up. It's why I opened with, um, which I think is an important point, and we need to perhaps do a little bit more work on this, how parliaments operate um, in times of pandemic. I mean, the European Parliament is slightly different in that there isn't government in opposition, but we are required, if you like, to oversee what the Commission is doing. When it comes to member state governments and parliaments, um, you know, it is difficult if you physically cannot be in a chamber together. Um, I mean, that's a, a basic difficulty and how that is organised, and I, I think there is always a sense for opposition parties that they don't they haven't access if you like to the same floor and platform to speak i mean i i would and you'd be surprised if i said otherwise think that the irish government has performed well on many fronts during this pandemic uh, which has been very difficult and we think today of the families that are grieving because of the pandemic um, as we begin to ease up on on the restrictions but i think what the government has been led with in terms of the functioning of the parliament itself is the public health advice which restricts how many times people can meet. I mean, even in our political group meetings, we are spaced out, obviously, um, and rightly so, so that we uh, adhere to the strict measures that we expect citizens to adhere to. Um, I'm not sure how this will uh, pan out when the survey is done across Europe. And indeed, one of uh, the ideas we're discussing here with the President of the Parliament is that we might, as a Parliament, um, engage with Member State Parliaments in the coming months uh, to see how we all responded and to learn lessons and perhaps make recommendations. And I think that's something that will be very useful because there's nothing worse than forgetting something that is learned in crisis when indeed we may need to uh, use that information at some future time. So generally, I think, yes, it's been, it's been difficult. It's been particularly difficult in Ireland because we have uh, a government that has, if you like, um, you know, has to ha keep going until there's another government. Um, and therefore, there is that tension naturally around um, the parties. Uh, but so far, I think so good. And I hope that, um, and I have no more information than you do, so read nothing into my lips or my words. I do hope that there will be some outcome on those government formation talks. I expect at the weekend, but perhaps you have wiser knowledge than I. Thank you, Vice President, for that. And I have uh, quite a few more questions, but I have one here from Suzanne Keating from Docus, and it's, it's a fairly lengthy comment, but as you uh, mentioned, it's, it's as much a discussion um, as a question and answer. She asks, how inward focused is the mood within the European Parliament at the moment, do you think? We're seeing a worrying trend towards uh, more of a Europe first, close to our borders approach rather than a more ambitious perspective to think and act globally to address social inequality as well as climate. For example, how will it act post-COVID in terms of reprioritizing the sustainable development goals and having a much more proactive approach to help marginalized groups and fragile countries beyond Europe or near neighbors? And uh, I have another one here from Uno Dwyer on, a, well, not necessarily difficult, different topic. Uh, could you explain why the new parliament is working on an unusually high number of requests for legislative initiatives for an MMF contingency plan? Is this coincidental or a deliberate strategy? Um, and I'm going to take advantage, if you can take three, of um, uh, a question of my own, which is the, uh, we were talking about the recovery fund and the vast um, a range of um, financial incentives. Uh, it is the case that not all the groups in the European Parliament are supportive of the recovery fund. Do you see this? We, we have uh, divergences among the European Council and the approval for, but do you see a problem in the European Parliament in passing a recovery fund? Uh, I hope yeah, that's not too much to cope with. No, no, um, and I may not answer them as well as I should or as, you, as well as you wish, but let me start with your own question. Um, I think that, as I mentioned, when the announcement was made, there was a general um, relief, perhaps, and um, some uh, element of uh, anxiety being lifted that Europe was responding and in a significant way. And then we've had the conversations internally in political groups and indeed in member states as to, is this the right way forward? Is this enough? Is it too much? Who pays? 
So in a sense, the questions of where, when, why, and all of those things are, the, are being debated. I think the Parliament's response was positive. Within that, there are different views as to how it should be structured. There are different views as to whether we should push out the repayment date for as long as possible or repay now. And that really depends on your political attitude. So those will be resolved. I never worry about tensions or differences of opinion here in the parliament. That's what we thrive on to some extent. And then we always come to um, an agreement between ourselves as to how we move forward. So if there weren't differences of opinion, I would be more worried. So I think those things can be dealt with. Perhaps to your point around those frugal member states who I had thought one of them might have been shifting a little. There still is huge reluctance. Um, but even from some of the members um, of parliament from those countries, there are different views so that it isn't as if everybody from those four has a certain way of thinking. So that there is a capacity, if you like, not to persuade, but also to allow those to come around to accepting or agreeing to what's uh, being proposed. I mean, one of the difficult issues would be around own resources. Um, so those who um, are being asked to contribute more to the budget, will they be willing to allow um, the European Union, if you like, create more of its own resources? So the debate is now, and there are no answers to that debate, but the time is short. And I think that the timeline the Commission has proposed that everything will be well in place by the end of this year is, is really ambitious, but it's necessary because this budget, the MFF, runs out. So we need a new budget for 2021. Um, on the first question, um, I think that's a really, really good question about whether Europe is becoming more inward. Um, and it is why I mentioned in my last few moments of my conversation with you that I was a little concerned around some of the language, even around the um, uh, pharmaceuticals, that we should, if you like, bring it all back home, the manufacturing back to Europe. Um, not that we do need to look at that as one issue, but that did it, if you like, speak to the point that you have made in your comment of becoming more inward focused. And I think that that would be a shame if it were to happen. So I've been quite careful careful even in some of my amendments to that particular report on the supply of pharmaceuticals to try and speak to that point that Europe is really important globally now because other players, leading players, are perhaps not uh, as focused globally um, as Europe is. And I would hope that we don't take that approach. As you know, in different member states, there are different views on, on this issue. Um, but I think from an Irish point of view, because we need to be globally focused um, because of our size, first of all, but also the fact that we're big traders, um, I think we should help that conversation. And where we see it steering in that direction, we should not allow that to happen. And when it comes to, you know, assisting um, the developing world in aid, etc., we have a lot of work we could do to support them around renewable energies, which will also help us. So I think there's a lot of synergies there where we need to look globally and not look inwardly because we won't achieve our best if we do that. But you're right to raise it um, because it would be wrong if it does creep in and is not curtailed. And one of the things I perhaps should have mentioned that the Parliament here, and again, to the credit of President Sassoli, when our facilities couldn't be used by members because we weren't here, they were used by um, marginalized groups here who needed food, who needed shelter. Um, and equally, just to mention that our, our building in Strasbourg was used by the health authorities there as a testing center. So I think we in the Parliament would try and keep that outward focus. Um, and I think our development committee will certainly keep us on our toes in in that regard. But, you know, over the last while, there has been that tendency since perhaps the economic crash to have that inward focus. The pandemic, in a way, where we were all bringing citizens back home, um, where we were, there was closure of borders, perhaps has accelerated a feeling of people looking inwards. On the other hand, I think once Europe um, got to grips with this pandemic and the president of the commission acted swiftly and well, um, where she apologized to those within Europe who felt they had not been properly dealt with, our Italian colleagues and Spanish, um, I think that she has had a much more global approach, even to the point where the raising of funds for the vaccine, uh, development of vaccines. So um, I think DOCAS and others should keep us on our toes on that because I mean, I think a strong Europe internally, but weak globally, is a weak Europe. Um, well, the other question was, the, explain... The initiatives, um, yes, that the European Parliament um, has... Uh, the new Parliament seems to be working on an unusually high number of requests for legislative initiatives from the Commission. 
Uh, well, like it was about that con contingency plan. Yeah, well, I mean, it, well, it's, it's, I suppose, the desire of the Parliament, and it was something that we had discussed with uh, the President of the Commission, that we would have these initiatives. We also have special committees, and they've just been announced today, one of them around cancer, another, a committee of inquiry into the transportation, allied transportation of animals, which I think will be of, of interest to Ireland, um, and other committees. And I think that it's appropriate that the Parliament feels that where there are areas that we would like to push um, in terms of legislation, that we have the capacity to do that. But there are always checks and balances to it. I mean, this is an interesting parliament. We're one year old. Uh, there are more new members than old. I'm one of the oldies, um, and in many ways, I have to say. Um, I never thought it would last this long, but it's, it's interesting how time flies. And I'm reminded of Avril Doyle making that point to me many years ago that, you know, the five years here in demand, it feels like five weeks. But every parliament is different. Um, and I do think that the context of of the way the world is at the moment, which is not, not in a pretty place in terms of cooperation, the way Europe is reacting to a public health crisis, the way we now realize that the road to recovery will require public investment in infrastructure, um, is changing the dynamic somewhat. So I think it's only right that we, as who are elected directly um, by the citizens of Europe, would take initiatives as appropriate. We won't always get our way, but it's certainly right that we take those initiatives. I would like to think though that within our political groups, we talk more with our political parties um, in our member states because sometimes the gulf there is larger and wider than it needs to be. What will be fascinating, if I may say, around government formation talks, if they come to fruition and we do have uh, Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil and the Greens together, that in this parliament here, we will have the EPP group that I sit with, the Renew group that Fianna Fáil sit with and the Greens where there are two colleagues. And it'll be interesting to see how we vote on different issues. So we, we will have a government of three um, in our Ireland, perhaps, uh, and you know we will have to resolve issues here in the European Parliament. So nothing about politics is easy at the moment, and indeed nothing is certain either. And I think in the in the years I've been in the Parliament, and um, that's what strikes me that around every corner where you thought it was a clear view, it very often there isn't a clear view at all. Um, and that's why if you come back to this idea on a conference of the future of Europe, you know a lot of people are waking up to many issues that perhaps were just dormant in their minds and want to be part of the conversation. And that's why if those of you listening have any influence, it would be good that you talk to people, uh, particularly at council level, to get this up and running. Thanks very much, Vice President. Actually, it's the next question is very much uh, in the line of, of uh, communication between the Parliament and, and national governments. And it's, could the new working methods developed during the COVID crisis be used for a more intensive dialogue between the European Parliament committees and their national counterparts? for example, uh, on discussion on the substance of proposed EU legislation. I don't know if you'd just like to continue on with that one. Well, I think it's an absolutely great question and it's absolutely right to raise it because we have learned to, if you like, work in new ways because we had to. So necessity was the mother of invention. I mean, for example, even within my own political party, Fianna Gael, our meetings, uh, our parliamentary party meetings are remote. And they're excellent. Um, and in fact, from a, my point of view, where they're normally on a Wednesday night, a physical meeting in Dublin, we rarely can be there, but I'm now available to connect with my colleagues um, because I can do this remotely. And I think that should transfer to engagement at committee level, or indeed a few elected national parliamentarians who want a briefing on something, or indeed if I want to hear their view on a particular issue, should use the technology. Now, of course, we all can slip back into our old ways. Um, and I think it will be a shame if that were to happen because it's been really interesting. For example, all of my staff are, are remote working. And they're fantastic and they're working really well and it's, it's, it's amazing what can be achieved. So there's no reason why the good bits of um, the way we work now because of the pandemic could be kept and in fact strengthen that bond which is not strong enough between the European Parliament and national parliaments. And indeed I think governments could do more to strengthen that as well so that you don't need to be physically present but you can use technology in a way that we perhaps were shy of using. And I think we need to be less formal. I, I think sometimes when you're, I mean, this is, is formal, but also informal. Sometimes if you're setting things up for months and we're doing it regularly, it becomes mundane. Whereas if it's that you need to speak on 
you know, peatlands or some particular issue that you can get somebody from the commission, the parliament and from the member state and we can have a very good dialogue. I don't know how many webinars I've done since this pandemic hit and I'm many more next week and I've learned an awful lot from them. So I'm, I'm for one with keeping with the good parts and using the technology to best advantage. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and yes, and we'll be hopeful for the future. We'll have learned a lot from our experience uh, uh, in the technological area. Another question uh, from Ethna McDermott, who thanks you for a terrific and very interesting informed talk. Uh, and she said she would welcome uh, some words on your thoughts about the recent judgment of the German Constitutional Court. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'll deal with that. I was almost going to read what, uh, maybe it's the wisest thing to do, what the President of the Commission, um, Ursula von der Leyen, said, that they've taken note, as the Parliament has, of the German court. And in fact, we're organising a hearing in the Constitutional Affairs Committee on this very subject. Um, and I think the last two lines are, are important because they're what the Parliament are doing. And, and I'll just read them rather than make them up, where we are at one with the Commission. We are now analysing the ruling of the court in detail and we will look into possible next steps from the commission point of view this may include the option of infringement proceedings and the statement she made goes on to say that the European Union is a community of values and law which must be upheld and defended at all times it's what keeps us together and it's what we stand for so I think there was just to reflect on that ruling I mean there was quite an intake of breath when the ruling was made some of my German colleagues um, explained it in a way which made it sound more technical than political about just ju the justification for what the um, the ECB were doing you know, wasn't clear enough. Uh, however, I think we in the Constitutional Affairs Committee would like to hear from other legal experts about what their view is. So it certainly hasn't gone unnoticed and couldn't because it was quite a significant ruling. But I would say watch out for more uh, on this and certainly more from uh, the Parliament side as to how we interpret what the court said, because I mean, if, if that ruling were to prevail, uh, where does that put the European Court? And we would always say that the European Court would prevail. Okay, yes. Thank you very much indeed for that. I have a couple of questions on the cap on which I know you are, you are an expert. Uh, there is, uh, I think if I recall, in the new budget, uh, an extra four billion for, for the cap. Uh, the question is, do you feel that this is sufficient uh, for the cap at the present time? And uh, added to this is a question on biodiversity. Uh, would you envisage that farmers would be paid to farm for biodiversity? As I think in um, uh, the reference is to the very successful Barren Life Programme, yep. which uh, won a European award for initiative in that regard. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'll take the biodiversity point first and thank you for it. Um, and yes, the burn is fantastic and I had the privilege of presenting awards. I thought it was last year, but actually it was the previous year um, to those Farming for Nature award winners. Um, but it was interesting, there was a, a story in The Guardian about the burn, which was fantastic to see, but it basically said that food would not be the um, priority commodity, if you like, produced on the farm. It would be about the other public goods. Um, but this is a conversation that is, I think, at its peak at the moment about how do we farm sustainably, um, how can we encourage farmers to, um, if you like, farm with biodiversity in mind? Um, and you know, I think we have to put our hands up as policymakers that some of what was implemented in the past has actually led to the situation today where we are concerned about biodiversity. I'm, I was, my first job uh, many, many years ago was on a program called Landmark in RTE. And one of my colleagues at the time, and he's long gone, Kieran Kassan, if you recall him, we used to do fantastic programs about showing farmers to drain peatlands. It was the biggest story of the moment and how they were supported with grant aid to drain peatlands. And today that is quite a shocking thing to say because we now realize that peatlands are vital for carbon sequestration. And if anything, we need to re-wet peatlands. So the conversation has gone full circle. And yes, I think the objective of the next cap is to encourage um, farmers through eco schemes to do more for environmental uh, delivery. And there will be extra supports for schemes in rural development, which speaks to the first question about um, targeting schemes for climate 
climate, environment and biodiversity. Uh, so they are very much linked. Uh, my, my personal view, and I've said this on many occasions, that I, I would like to see schemes that give long-term benefit and not short-term. That a scheme that lasts five years, um, if you plant a habitat, and where the funding is gone after five years, the, the result may well be that that habitat is ripped up and that's not what we want to see. Equally, the common agriculture policy as it currently frames discourages farmers from maintaining a landscape features because very often the field of rushes or the scrubland is deducted um, so there is no payment for that part of a farm um, and we can change that and I've already raised this with Vice President Timmermans in the Commission I think Minister Creed has raised this so we need to reinterpret what we call good environmental uh, and agricultural condition to, to receive payments but what this will mean when it comes to the overall budget and we've been pushing for more we've got more now through rural development and we hope that that will be sustained but there's always been a strain on on what would be available for agriculture but it will result in a redistribution of payments between farmers and that's been a difficult issue not just now but in the past once we moved our, our payment regime away from production linked payments it was also was going to be sensitive when we re, if you like link them to land um, and now as we're moving, perhaps not in 100%, but partly towards linking to uh, those elements around biodiversity, so results-based payments, they are complicated, but they are, if you like, the direction of travel. Um, and I, what I would like to say now that I have an opportunity by way of those questions is that I would love to see uh, more environmentalists and farmers walking the fields together rather than perhaps on social media having a go at each other because there's a huge interest um, amongst the general public to have a more sustainable environment and, and amongst farmers to deliver that and I think that the conversations will be better if we could just learn from each other. I mean it, it's been quite fascinating sometimes when comments are put up the, the level of and we've seen it in other issues recently of, of agitation rather than saying actually we're in this together and we can learn from each other and I think for farmers uh, and there will probably farmers tuning in that rather than seeing this trend as an attack on their way of life or on how they're farming today, you could see this as a huge opportunity for, at two levels. One is at your own micro level because sometimes using that amount of fertilizer isn't a good idea if you could use it better by precision agriculture and save costs and perhaps add, add uh, a necessary boost to income. And secondly, from an Irish and all island perspective where we are regarded as a major agriculture producer, that if we can have a stamp of greater sustainability, it means that we can proudly on the European and global markets talk about what we're doing in terms of sustainability. So I think to those two questions, there are great examples of where farmers collectively and individually are going and doing great things. And sometimes the headlines we read perhaps in the press don't reflect that. Although again, I'm beginning to see a little bit more nuanced reaction to issues like the farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy. So I think there is that concern that we can actually move forward together. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're coming, uh, we have only about five minutes, but I have two questions if I could ask uh, uh, for your comments on them. One is something that is very current and indeed in today's papers, I think. It's from Anna Ludwinek uh, of Eurofound, and that the European Parliament has just set up several new committees, one dealing with disinformation. How far the European, should the European Parliament go in tackling state-driven disinformation campaigns such as from Russia and China. And what is your view of um, the EEA as bowing, it seems, to pressure from China with their report on the topic? That is one. And the other one um, that I had is the uh, situation with, in the European Parliament with regard to nationalism and the, um, and the question of uh, flouting um, European norms and laws. How is the European Parliament preparing to deal with uh, with uh, countries who do not accept the European uh, principles and norms. Just um, your comments on that as a last series. Okay, the two easy ones are left to last. I mean, the first one on, on this disinformation, uh, because all of us have been caught out with various things that we've read on social media, presuming them to be true, and then feeling quite 
silly when they weren't. Um, and that's okay when it's jokey, but it's not okay when it is a drip feed of disinformation, which impacts on the public perception and opinion. Um, and I think there's a very strong editorial in the Irish Times today on that particular issue. And the commission this week have been very strong in, in what it's doing. So I think Europe is responding well to that. But to get ahead of those that spread disinformation is extremely difficult. Um, and that's why um, what the parliament is doing is very important. And, uh, you know, the truth is we're all grappling with the constant evolution of social media, the constant evolution of access to information, which could be true or false. Um, and therefore, I think it's hugely important that we do much more on it. I mean, even around COVID-19, which was the focus of what the commission were talking about uh, this week, I mean, it was horrific, some of the stories that were put out there about the virus. It also impacted on people's behavior. Um, so it's, it's in a very important subject. And some of my colleagues um, are very involved in it. And I think what the parliament will do working with the commission will be hugely important. But it's also an issue for the platforms. Um, and I think more and more we're going to have to have, as we are already having, very tough conversations with the social media platforms that they have a responsibility on many different fronts, disinformation, child pornography, all sorts of you know, violence, etc. cetera, um, that if you provide a platform for, these, um, for the good and the bad, you have to take some responsibility for what uh, the outcome is. So that will be a huge part of our work um, because it also impacts on people's views of the European Union disinformation, if you like, and it links to your second question that you put to me about this nationalism or nativism sometimes around what individual um, countries are doing. And that's a very difficult issue. I mean, one of the member states this week has issued details of a questionnaire they're sending out to their citizens. And those of you who have read the questionnaire will know the details of it. The questions are very loaded to get a particular answer. Um, and it, we're, we're finding difficulty in dealing with that, to be quite frank, because um, there are member states who act that way, who want to be part of Europe, but distinct from Europe, and indeed have a view about how Europe should, if you like, be reshaped, um, while those of us who accept the values and norms of today are holding to those. So I think we can do our best to be aware of what's going on. I think in, in terms of uh, this recovery package, the Parliament, I think, will be interested and anxious to stitch in adherence to rule of law issues uh, in terms of conditionality, whether we achieve that or not, because the Council may have a different view. Um, um, so I think we are well aware of those two issues, the, um, the disinformation and the individualism of some member states. And indeed, there will be another member state in the spotlight next week uh, on a, a different issue about access to EU funding. So we're not dealing with a perfect union, that's for sure. Um, we are dealing, and I suppose even the COVID um, and response to it has shown how individual member states felt they were better than the rest. And, and I mean, that plays into this idea that I'm better than you. And that's not how Europe started and not, it's not how Europe should end or, or complete its, its journey towards a, a more coherent European Union. Those two issues will determine that. Um, and, you know, some of the leaders uh, speak to what is, I suppose, that very, um, how will I put it without being, um, yeah, let me choose my words carefully here, um, the macho image of the leader. I don't think that's effective or appropriate in the world of today, where as to the question from Dokus requires Europe, which has much more riches than the rest and much more in terms of civil liberties and freedoms to be a leader and that we shouldn't diminish what's happening um, globally by allowing ourselves to be diminished internally. Thanks very much indeed, Vice President. I think that's a very good point on which to end the conversation. And thank you very much for all the time and, and just the sheer amount of information that you have given us in your talk. Uh, I think we wish you well. You mentioned you're staying over the weekend into next week. Uh, I think we appreciate the effort that's been made at a uh, European level to uh, keep um, working and, and keep the uh, initiatives going in this very difficult time in producing the, the plans that they have. And uh, next week is going to be a very a crucial week, as you mentioned, with the meeting on Monday and the Parliament meeting on Brexit next week. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very Come much. With us, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all. Bye.